Well, greetings and welcome to the fifth in our study in the book of Colossians. Uh, tonight we're going to do a short recap first as we consider where we've come from and then we'll move into the remainder of our study. So we're going to be week five, Epistle to the Colossians, the effectiveness uh, is our topic, our heading for tonight, and we'll be looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 20 to 23. Now you'll remember as we began, <clears throat> we started with an overview in week one of the geographic and the historical context of the letter of, to the Colossi church, as well as a number of reasons why the book was written. In week two, we looked at the greetings of Paul under the heading of encouragement. And of course, this was to people that he had never met, but he had heard much of their Christian walk. In week three, we considered the deep exercise that Paul had for these believers, uh, believers that he had never met, but still prayed for. And we recall that wonderful prayer, especially in um, verses 9, 10, and 11. And then last week, we turned our attention to the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ as we considered him preeminent over first creation and then over the church. And today, we'll be returning our attention to the effectiveness of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in rescuing, redeeming, and reconciling us to God. So let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for this precious time that we have together when we can open your word, we can look into it, we can study it, we can consider uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his person, but also his work, the work of um, redemption, the work of reconciliation. We just pray that you will bless our time together this evening and just ask that you would uh, give us insight into your word that might help us to know and understand uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ even better. And so we just commit each one now into your hands. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. So tonight we're going to look at the effectiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, under four headings. Uh, the purpose of Christ in verse 20, the provision of Christ in verse 21, the presentation or the presenting of Christ uh, in verse 22, and then the perfecting of Christ in verse 23. And so before we go any further, let's turn to our passage. Let's turn to our book, Colossians chapter 1, and let's read these verses together. Uh, last week we finished with verse 19 in the previous chapter, but I'd like for the sake of connection uh, to include verse 19 as we start to read together. Colossians 1, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And the Lord will bless just the reading of those few verses together. There are a short number of verses, but very rich in the teaching that we have uh, regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. So first we want to consider the peace accomplished through his blood. Peace accomplished through his blood. Um, the purpose of Christ. This is the number one thing as we consider what was the purpose of Christ in going to the cross. And that purpose is reconciling, reconciling us to God. But you know, by definition, <laughs> reconciliation is when two parties that are enemies, that are far apart, that are separated by their differences, decide to reconcile, they come together with each side willing to compromise, willing to give up something in order to come closer to a compromise position in the middle. Um, we don't reconcile God to us. There's no reconciliation on our part. We don't even meet him halfway 
reconciliation comes completely and absolutely through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are reconciled to him, not he reconciled to us. Secondly, it says in our verse that by him or through him is the better translation. This reconciliation is accomplished. And you know, this word again, as we were reminded, is to make peace. To be reconciled it means to make peace. And the world longs for peace. We see that over and over in Scripture, this longing for peace. I read an illustration um, a while back that said that the former president of the, Norweg the Norwegian Academy of Sciences and historians from England, Egypt, Germany, and India I came up with some startling information. Since 3600 BC, the world has known only 2,092 years of peace. During this period, there have been over 14,351 wars, large and small, in which 3.64 billion people have died. The value of the property destroyed would pay for a golden belt around the world 97.2 miles wide and 33 feet thick. Six 650 BC, there have also been 1,656 arms races, uh, only 16 of which did not end up in war. The remainder ended in the economic collapse of all of the country, countries that were involved. But you know, we get this wonderful picture of the reconciling work of the Lord Jesus Christ as he reconciles us to God. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, we read this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, Earlier in that same chapter, in verse 1 and 2, we read this, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so we see that that reconciliation comes through him, through our Lord Jesus Christ. We read that in our verse. We also read here in, uh, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20 that through him he came to reconcile all things, all things. And you know, the phrase all things is found 148 times in Scripture, seven times in the book of Colossians alone. It literally means what it says, all things. Last week, we read Colossians 1, 16, 17, 18, and 20 about the creation of the world, and over and over it referred to all things. Let's read those verses together. Verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And verse 17, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And then it says in verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. And so it's a word that's a very important phrase, all things. It means everything. It refers to all of creation. We're told that even creation was affected by the fall. <clears throat> the reconciliation is complete in one act, in one event, and that's the, that event is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so positionally and eternally, uh, we are reconciled to God, but in the same way as with sanctification, where we are positionally sanctified, but need to continue to have an ongoing sanctification as long as we live in this world, there is a need for us to be uh, continually reconciled, uh, as does the created world and the universe. All things are being reconciled to him. And so eternally we're reconciled. Um, but we often have these times, and we'll talk in a moment just about a few of those things. But we look at the vehicle, number four here. It says, uh, not only all things, but through his blood, through his blood. In this we see the combination of humanity and the deity of Christ through his blood. 
And again, there are two thoughts here, just in the same way we've read in other places. There are two thoughts behind this. The first always for Paul is a continual rebuke of the false teachers, because by stressing the humanity of Christ, he stressed the fact that God, that he was fully human and fully God. He was in the, in the body of himself able to reconcile. But Paul also talks here about the power of the blood of Christ. And so he just wasn't talking about uh, theoretically for the, for the Gnostics, but the power, the, the literal reality of the power of blood. We see it, of course, throughout the Old Testament. The Old Testament is rich in references to the redemptive power of the shed blood. We see it, first of all, in the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve sinned, and the first animal had to be slain in order to cover Adam and Eve from the sin that they had committed. We're reminded of the saving power of the blood in the Passover story uh, in Exodus, when the blood of this uh, lamb without blemish was placed on the lintel and on the doorposts, and the angel uh, of death would come over, would pass over if it saw the blood. It was a, there was a, a literal reality to the saving power of the blood in the Passover story. We see it demonstrated even more in the tabernacle, where the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. And this was something that had to happen over and over, year after year after year. All of these and many others were looking forward to the coming of Christ in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find that through uh, him revealed in Hebrews chapter 9. It says, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, we read this, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so there's a very powerful aspect in the purpose of Christ and the reconciling purpose of Christ is that it had to happen through his blood. And then in verse uh, in, in First Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, we get the same, uh, same thought again. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so his blood, very important part of this reconciliation. But then also where it happened, lastly, we read in that same verse that it was through the shedding of blood, uh, through the blood of his cross, of his cross, we read uh, Alexander McLaren says thus, The cross is the center of the world's history. The incarnation of Christ and the crucifixion of our Lord are the pivot around which all the events of the ages revolve. And that's true. Everything prior to the cross looked forward to the cross. Everything since that time looked back to the cross as that time when reconciliation and the possibility of reconciliation came to mankind. In Hebrews chapter 9, again, verse 22, we see the significance of the cross where the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood, where it says, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, but without shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. And so it happened on the cross, and it happened through his shed blood. The Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself, Philippians 2, verse 8, he humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Uh, the cross was a place of great shame, a curse. A curse it is everyone that, that hangs on the tree. And yet the Lord did that. He did that for us. The cross also became a symbol of Christ's redeeming work, his reconciling work, and his renewing work in the lives of the believers. So first of all, peace was accomplished through his blood. Secondly, we see pardon for the alienated. We were referred to in verse, uh, in verse 21 as the alienated. We were alienated from God, but have been reconciled by his death. And so we see the provision of Christ. First of all, we think of our condition as those that were alienated. 
This was our previous character before God, before salvation. We were alienated. This was our lost life before Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us that you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That's what it means to be alienated, to be away from God. It means to be controlled by the prince of the power of the air, to be controlled by Satan. The enemies of God are described as being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. That's a terrible, terrible list of things. But it is a description of the world that we live in today. And we find that description in Romans chapter 1, verse 29 through 31. We want none of those things to be a part of us. If we are born again, if we've been pardoned, if we've been reconciled by God, if we've been brought into this new relationship with him, none of those things should be part of us. But you know, the Bible describes how it is that we become alienated to God. And in this verse, we find there are three separate ways that show how we came to be separated or or far away from him, from God. First of all, it refers to us as enemies. We were enemies. Satan is the first and greatest enemy of God. But the Bible makes that clear that in rejecting God, unbelievers also make themselves God's enemies. Philippians 3 tells us, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. And then James 4 says this, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And so that's how we end up as enemies of God, because we love the world more than we love God. But this, again, should only be the characteristics, the character of those who are not redeemed, who are not reconciled. But we're reminded in this passage also, in verse 21, that uh, not only are we enemies, but that that enmity, that hostility that we have towards God, begins in the mind. Our understanding is perverse and corrupt. And we compare that with the call that we had in in chapter 1, as we read chapter 1 and Paul's prayer for the believers there, is he prayed that they might be filled with the knowledge of God's will, with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That is not the the spiritual understanding. That is not the understanding of the world. The world's wisdom and the world's understanding is contrary to God. It's opposed to God. It's hostile to God. But the Bible shares many warnings about the corruption of the mind. As we think back to one of the earliest places we read this is in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of 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 the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And of course, this was right before uh, God commissioned uh, Noah to build the ark and uh, and, uh, prophesied that he would destroy the world, destroy those that were um, evil. Their hearts were evil continually. In Romans chapter 8, again, back in the New Testament, it says this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
because the carnal mind is enmity with God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 8 and verse 5 through 8. And then the third thing we see here, not just that we're enemies, not just that it begins in our mind, but that it is characterized by wicked works. The word wicked means evil. But the thought behind this it focuses especially on the evil actions that flow from a, a wicked character or an evil character, an evil heart. Jeremiah 17 says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's man. That's what we are. We are desperately wicked. Our heart is deceitful above all things. Many years ago, a well-known British journalist and a Christian apologist, Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, once said this, The depravity of man is at once the most empirically verifiable reality but at the same time, the most intellectually resisted fact. And of course, this is true. Every person knows the sad truth of their own heart. They know the evil of their own heart. Each of us do. We know our evil heart. But most people would still tell you that they consider themselves to be good people. But the Bible is very clear that there are no good people. We're all sinners. In both the Old Testament and the New, we find the reference to this. In Psalm 14, it says, They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. And then the same thing in Romans 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. And again, just thinking back to the prayer that Paul prayed for the believers in Colossae back in verse 9 and 10. One of the things he prayed for would be that they would be fruitful in every good work, comparing that to a heart that is uh, at war with God and that is filled, um, the mind is filled with evil and is demonstrated through wicked works or evil works. Now contrasted, being fruitful in every good work. That's the plan for God. We get this wonderful verse in Ephesians chapter 2 as we finish up this thought here. It says in Colossians 1.10, um, the wicked works done by those who are the enemies of God, good works should demonstrate our love and our loyalty to our Savior and a recognition of the great work of salvation that's been done on our behalf. Uh, this is a very dark and very discouraging verse that we've read together about us being alienated, but it ends on a high note. Yet now he has reconciled. Yet now he has reconciled. And again, uh, through his blood, through his cross, uh, this has happened. Ephesians chapter 2 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's something that we can praise the Lord for. <clears throat> Our third point here, um, as we go to verse 22, is presented an acceptable through his completed work. And so we see this desire here, this uh, effectiveness of Christ in presenting us uh, as holy, presenting us as new creature, uh, creatures who have been reconciled to God. At the beginning, we mentioned uh, that the purpose of Christ was to reconcile us to God. But that purpose continues beyond just our standing before God. We are also redeemed, but Christ's purpose is also to present us holy. And so we see here, first of all, reconciliation by Christ. We're reminded that the Lord accomplished this reconciliation in the body of his flesh through death. And it was essential that sin be dealt with by a perfect man. The curse and the penalty of sin fell on man in the Garden of Eden. In Romans chapter 5, we read of the important comparison of the sin of the first Adam uh, and the redemption by the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one's man, one man's obedience many will be made righteous. And I would encourage you, we don't have time tonight to do that, but uh, I would encourage you to go to Romans chapter 5 and read that full passage from verse 12 through verse 21. Um, just a very encouraging passage, uh, one to study uh, and to meditate on.
So first, reconciled by Christ, and then secondly, presented the presentation by Christ. Now that the work of salvation is complete, we read the continuing purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is to present us holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And so I wanted to just think of those words for just a couple of minutes. Uh, what do those words mean? What does it mean to be holy? The thought behind holiness is that we are sanctified, that we are set apart to God. And if you remember, as we went through our greetings at the beginning in, um, in uh, Colossians 1, the first two verses, the believers there are referred to as the saints, the faithful saints. Uh, these were ones who've been set apart to the work of God. We are new creatures with new life, new purpose, new obligations. I read this quote, and I think this is a great one, uh, by J.C. Ryle that talks a little bit about what does holiness mean. Holiness is the habit of being of one mind with God, according as we find his mind described in Scripture. It is the habit of agreeing in God's judgment, hating what he hates, loving what he loves, and measuring everything in this world by the standards of his word. If we could live up to that, uh, we would be on our way to being holy. The second word we see there is the word blameless. Blameless. The preferred word uh, of the um, translators is to be without blemish. And according to Vine's expository dictionary, the Hebrew word translated as blameless in Psalm 15 verse 2 describes a person with nothing in his outward activities or internal disposition that is odious to God. That's a great word, odious, um, foul-smelling. Uh, there's nothing in our character, nothing inwardly or outwardly uh, that should displease God. Again, I would encourage you to read the whole of Psalm 15. It's not a very long psalm, but it'll give you a great picture uh, and fuller description of what it means to be a blameless person. This was always the Lord's purpose for us as individuals, but also for the church. Uh, we read in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And the church will be holy when the people of God are holy. And so that's the, that's the purpose, the, the continuing purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ. The third thing we see in this uh, verse is that we should be holy, blameless, but above reproach. In the original Greek, the word implies not just mean, merely to be acquitted of something, but the absence of even a charge or an accusation against that person. Um, again, this is Vine's New Testament uh, words. We read this. And in uh, Romans chapter 8, again, we read this great passage which reminds us of that. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. <clears throat> who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. There is nothing in us that bears an accusation, even though we read in Revelation 12 um, that there is an accuser. We read there, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren, which again is Satan, the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. We are without reproach because the Lord Jesus Christ bore our reproach. And then number four in our verse here is in his sight. That is in the sight of God the Father. The Son pleases the Father by presenting to him those that have been redeemed and reconciled. The same thought appears again in Hebrews at the end of Hebrews 13 in the benediction. Hebrews 13 verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of his everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. In his sight, we are to be pleasing 
in his sight. And we can only be that if we are made holy, made blameless, uh, above reproach. Um, and so we're reminded in the last section, the last verse of our time together, that there is a perfecting work that needs to be done for us or in us. And um, in chapter 23, uh, we see progress is assured through faith, and that comes through the perfecting work of Christ. Um, as we start that verse, it begins with the word if in verse 23. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope uh, of the gospel which you heard. And so William MacDonald addresses that because it sounds as though if we don't, um, or it, it appears that the verse teach is suggesting that uh, our continued salvation depends on our continuing in the faith. Uh, but but William MacDonald, Bill MacDonald, makes it very clear that he rejects that suggestion completely. The Bible teaches the eternal security of the believer. And so this is not a question of salvation, but a question of testimony. It's not connected to salvation, but to our walk of faith uh, once we're saved. Many believers can be wishy-washy or lukewarm uh, in their Christian walk. And in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul encourages the believers to grow in their faith and that they should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, Ephesians chapter 4. And so we're to be strengthened in our faith. And so there's the work that the Lord has done, his work, but our work, which of course we do with his strength and with his power, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, is that we're, first of all, to continue in the faith. We're called to be faithful, to run the race, to finish the course. And our new life in Christ is not just a task that can be completed, but is a lifelong commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. The way we finish faithfully is to remain continuing in the faith, remain close to the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be grounded or steadfast, uh, is the, the word we read uh, following that. We're to be continuing in the faith and to be grounded or steadfast. Our lives are to be built on a strong foundation. And that strong foundation is, is the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as obedience to his commands. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul addresses this. He says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. And so we're to be grounded in the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the next one is we're called to be steadfast steadfast, to be strengthened in the inner man, to be settled in our faith and belief. Uh, this is a critically important thing if we're going to continue in the faith. Uh, we need to know what we believe. We need to have discipline and commitment to know the Word of God, to understand the truths of the Word of God, and to apply them in our lives each day. And then lastly, it says they're not moved away. Not moved away. You know, Paul has seen this and has battled this already in other places. In fact, he rebukes the believers in the churches of Galatia in, uh, in the first chapter, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so we see a great turning away from the truth of the Word of God in the world today. We'll just finish with this thought here. The Barna Group, which surveys churches in North America, defined a biblical worldview as belief in the following things. Absolute moral truth exists. The Bible is completely inerrant, without error. Satan is a real being and not symbolic. A person cannot earn his way into the kingdom of God through good works. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth. And lastly, that God is the supreme creator of the heavens and earth and reigns over the whole universe today. 
that defines those those six things define a biblical worldview. In their survey, they found that less than one percent of all young people today have a biblical worldview, and those numbers were almost the same among those that profess to be Christians. And so we do see a moving away from the truth of the gospel. At the end of this last verse here, it says, Paul used himself as an example. Uh, he preached the gospel, um, the same gospel that he heard and that he delivered to them. And he now is a minister of Christ. He's been called to be a witness for Christ, called to preach the gospel and to encourage believers <coughs> excuse me, in their walk. And so that's our call as we leave this uh, part of the passage behind. Are we willing to be ministers of the gospel, called to be witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ, and willing to apply these things that we've read together in truth? Let's close in prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for this time this evening. We thank you for your word and for these encouraging things. Uh, we thank you for the contrast between those that are far away from you and those that have been brought near. And our Father, we pray that if we have been brought near, if we belong to you, if we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are Christians, uh, followers of Christ, our Father, we pray that we might live our lives as though we are followers of Christ, that we might be grounded and steadfast and sure, that we might not move away from the truth of the gospel, but in all things we might look to Christ for leadership and direction and guidance in our lives. And so we thank you for this time together. Our Father, we just pray that you'll bless the remainder of our evening together as we commit it to you now in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Thank you.